Hallelujah. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Mount Zion, United Methodist Church, where I'm your pastor, I'm Dr. Vaughn Hayden. So uh, glad to be your pastor. So good to see each of you out this morning uh, to, to connect with you online and those in the parking lot just to be able to worship together. And uh, uh, here, of course, I'm very uh, proud to, to be here this week after last week. For those of you that, were, that got to uh, worship with us, got to, to witness my son as uh, he's uh, entering into his decisions to become a pastor and got a chance to, to preach last week. I'm very proud of him. I think he did a, a wonderful job. And if you missed that, I hope you get a chance to look at it at uh, uh, mzumc.com. Uh, but here we are in, the, in week four of Easter. So happy Easter. We still have some Easter lilies around to, to remind us that we're in the season of Easter. Uh, has the excitement faded? I didn't hear a lot, of, a lot of celebration of Easter like I did on Easter Sunday when I said happy Easter. It was loud. We kind of forgot we're still in the season of Easter perhaps. Sometimes... We forget. Oftentimes the excitement fades. The newness wears off. The novelty subsides. The emotions return to normal. It's hard to stay up that high all the time as resurrection, the, as the, the grave is empty and, and all the changes. It's hard to be at that level. And so I, I get it. And plus, after the initial shock, the initial joy, the initial celebration, we have the deal with the reality of, now what? Well, how do we make this change in the world normal in our lives? How do we, how do we make all that Easter represents, the, the phenomenon of Jesus as the risen Savior, Jesus as Lord, resurrected from the dead, Jesus as forgiving our sins, giving us new life, how, how do we make all that normal? What does that look like? What does our new life entail? Most importantly, as we've been talking about for the last three weeks, how do we get assurance? Assurance is a big key thing. Um, John Wesley, when he was first trying to come to faith, he'd been, in many reports, a Christian. He'd actually even been a, a priest. He was ordained in the Church of England. But as he took a missionary trip to Georgia, he realized he didn't have assurance of his faith. There was something he desired to have. He wanted to be sure. And uh, in time, he finally got it. We learned the first week of our series that assurance often comes through building our faith, growing in our faith. It's not an immediate thing. It's a process that we grow in. We learned the first week of some of the steps to take. It takes time and Certain things need to happen right away. Of course, we need to profess our faith in Jesus, put our, our trust in him, believe the resurrection, believe all that he is and said, and follow in his ways. Being baptized with the Holy Spirit, having God in us, the promise which Jesus gave and Jesus made, so that we can begin the process of sanctification, which is what really growing in faith is all about, becoming sanctified becoming holy. As you watch the little intro to the sermon series, you, you see it begins as we grow, and then at the end of the sermon series, we'll get a spoiler because it's kind of there every week. It ends up with holy. That's where we end. That's the process that we're going through, becoming sanctified, becoming holy, becoming transformed to be like Jesus. Hallelujah. Full of life, full of joy, full of hope, full of promise. Hallelujah. So after we discuss the first week, Peter contends that he will remind, continue to remind the Christians. He says, I will remind you of these things all the time, even though he knew he was going to die soon. And we learned last week that we are to believe the witnesses because their testimony is true. God has spoken through them with the Holy Spirit truths that may at some points confound the rational, but always portray the factual. I don't know if you got that. Sometimes it may confound the rational, but portray the factual. It's truth, even if we can't understand it. 
because it really happened. And sometimes, see, something's happened. We're like, I don't, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter in some sense if it makes sense. What matters is that it's true. It happened. Jesus did resurrect from the dead. Peter tells stories of what he saw, the Mount of Transfiguration. I, I did see that happen, and uh, I didn't understand it then. Jesus told us not to tell anybody until after he resurrected, and I didn't even know what that meant. But now, as he's writing this, he's telling these things. He says, I am an eyewitness. These events are true because we saw it. We're testifying to what we know. As Joseph reminded us last week, they didn't tell stories that just made themselves look good. That's one of the reasons you know that stories are true. <laughs> I can tell you stories that make me look good. Probably not true. Just saying. But if I tell you a story where I may look like a fool, I wish it wasn't true. <laughs> but it might be true. And Peter's telling stories where, where he, 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 as Joseph said, he looked like the fool. He said, I'll never betray you. And then before the rooster crows, three times. He didn't tell that for himself. He told it because it was true. And because of the salvation he found in Jesus Christ, he knew he had to tell these truths. He had to tell these events. The truth we should never be afraid to tell. The truth should never be overrated. We must believe the witnesses. But just as important as who we believe is important to know who we refuse to believe. It's important to know who we listen to, but we also need to know who we don't listen to. Because there are many stories that are told, much of which is fake news. Just this, stories with an agenda. Stories designed to lead us down one path or another, but not designed to free us with the truth, because the truth shall set you free. I didn't make that up. Jesus said that. The truth shall set you free. So we need the truth to be free. So after Peter declares the need to believe the witnesses, in 2 Peter chapter 2, he begins to talk about the need to reject heresies, to be careful who you believe and what you believe, because not everybody wants to give you the good, honest truth. If you have your Bibles and you wish to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2, we're going to begin in verse 1. It says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. They will even deny the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Now, as Peter begins this second chapter, he didn't know we were going to divide it into chapters, you know, or verses. That's, that's on us. He's still talking about th where men and women of God filled with the Holy Spirit wrote down and prophesied and proclaimed. And he said, as they were prophesying through the Holy Spirit, false prophets rose up. People who desired fame or fortune or perhaps simply people to like them or, or wanted power, but they didn't have the Word of God. They didn't know the Word of God. The Holy Spirit didn't move in them, but they thought, well, I surely have something to say. Surely people could listen to me. Why not? And they spoke things out of their own mind. And he acknowledges, as he's talking, that even though the world has changed because of Jesus Christ, there will still be false teachers bringing destructive ideas, destructive opinions. So how do we know the false teachers? How do we know what stories are true and false? I talked to this moment about Peter saying, look, I, we were eyewitnesses. If somebody's giving their testimony and it glorifies God, let me, you can give a testimony and it glorify you. That's not really a good testimony, in my opinion. Because if we're talking about the change that God has made, the testimony should glorify God. So if you're giving a testimony and it glorifies God, then you can give it credence. But the other thing we need to see is, is what the eyewitness says, is it true? And if it denies Jesus or extols Jesus. Let me, let me say it another way. As Peter says here, they bring you destructive opinions 
they will even deny the master who bought them. See, one of the ways you can know that these testimonies are false, you can know these teachings or heresy, is if they deny Jesus Christ. You say, I, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, you know, lots of people talk good about Jesus as a person, as a teacher, as a moralist, as Joseph said last week, as a healer, as somebody who you want to follow, somebody who has good things to say. We should listen to his teachings. But they deny the Christhood. They deny the Savior. They deny him as, as God. You may be surprised to know how many so-called churches deny Jesus or deny that Jesus bought us with a price. Of course, many of you probably know the Jehovah's Witnesses. Some people say that's a Christian group, but it's not because they deny that Jesus is God. The Mormons deny that Jesus is unique. The Universalists deny that Jesus is even important. And of course, Jews and Muslims deny the divinity and uniqueness of Jesus. All these are religions that some people say, well, we're all talking about the same thing. It's all God in a different way. It's not. There's only one truth, and I didn't make it up. It's not my truth. It's God's truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says that. He is the truth. And if we deny Jesus and who he is, we miss the gospel. We miss the truth. We miss it all. These other religions, part and parcel of it, is to deny the divinity of Christ. And yet, even among Protestants, people who, well, well good Christian Protestant denominations, they're not going to fall into this trap. Sure, you can go to any church and you'll hear good teaching, right? I mean, you know, Methodist churches, I'm sure. I'm going to get in trouble today. But I know this is true, that there are some Methodists who contend that Jesus was simply the one to show us the way to live, but deny the substitutionary atonement of the cross. There are some who deny that Jesus died on the cross to really save us from our sins. There are some that deny that we need to believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You say, Pastor, that can't be true. I wish it wasn't true. But I recently, within the last two months, was listening to some other sermons. Sometimes I like to hear somebody else preach to me, see if I can learn something. And I was astounded to hear a colleague say in a sermon that Jesus did not have to die. According to what I read, according to what Jesus said, what he told his disciples, what the Gospels declare, he said it time and time again, he was going to Jerusalem to be beaten, to be handed over to the authorities, to be flogged, and to be killed. And after three days, he would rise from the dead. He knew that going in. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to resurrect. It wasn't just happenstance. It didn't just happen that he died. This was part of the plan. This was part of the whole, the whole mission. When he left heaven, he knew he wasn't just coming down to spend some time. He wasn't on vacation here. He had a mission to go to the cross. That was the whole plan from the beginning. Did Jesus have to die? If he could have found a way to pay for our sins without it, why would he have died? Even after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, Luke talks about in chapter 24, he's walking with some disciples and they didn't recognize him. And they're talking about all the events that happened and they didn't understand. And it says, Jesus began to explain to them from the prophets and the law how the Son of Man must be treated this way. How he must 
endure all these things. He declared it's been that way from the Old Testament. This is what the gospel is. Certainly, as you recall, the Garden of Gethsemane. As you recall that night, after we remember the Lord's Supper, as you remember, uh, he went to the garden and prayed and prayed for hours. Blood, tears, sweat flowing down. He was praying, God, let there be another way. Nevertheless, not my will but thine, he says. If there was another way and Jesus didn't have to die, guess what? I don't think he would have. He had to die. But some people say, well, he didn't have to die. They deny the master who bought them with a price, his own blood. If you deny who Jesus is, what he did, why he did it, then you miss the gospel. And people in churches, even in our denomination, are denying this truth. Be careful who you listen to. We were bought with a price, a precious, precious price that we could never afford. The blood of the eternal Jesus, the Christ. And whoever denies that seems to be the one whom Peter is referring to in this, in this verse. False teachers who deny the master who bought them and bring swift destruction upon themselves. And that's just verse 1. It gets worse. Verse 2 says, Even so, many will follow their licentious ways. That's a good word, huh? Licentious ways. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be maligned. You see, when they begin to deny the master who bought them at the price, they begin to gloss over some of the holiness. They begin to gloss over some of the things that we're supposed to do, and they say, well, you have freedom to do all kinds of things. We have freedom in Christ to love others. We have freedom in Christ so the sin does not hold us down, but we don't have freedom to do whatever we want. We have freedom to do whatever God wants. But these, he talks, talk about licentious ways. And because of these teachers, the way of truth would be maligned. I don't think I need to report to you that the way of truth has been maligned. I don't think that's news to you, May maybe. But Christianity and Christians, if it is news, I want to let you know, Christianity and Christians have gotten a bad name. I mean, in our culture, evangelicals, which the word stands for those who proclaim good news. I mean, that sounds like a good thing have gotten a bad name. As though the good news of the gospel is a bad thing. That's an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. How can good news be a bad thing? It has nothing to do with the truth of the scripture. It has nothing to do with facts about Jesus. The, the, the fact that the way of the truth has been maligned has nothing to do with the love and forgiveness that Jesus gives and teaches us to give. It has to do with false teachers who preach something contrary to God's word and claim that it is. Oh, I don't think you heard me. Those who are skilled at twisting the words just enough to pervert what is good and make it evil. And they're all over. They're rampant. And then culture and society sees the bad fruit and claims the whole tree is bad. Well, I guess Jesus said, right, a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. But the problem is then they declare the whole orchard is bad. There may be a bad tree. There may be some bad fruit. But you know what? Fruit is still good to find a good fruit if you find a good tree. But our culture tries to say that, well, since there's some bad Christians, they must all be bad. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. Might as well. It's just wrong. Because there are so many good churches, so many good Christians, so many good preachers, 
people who have learned and are learning to love, to care, to forgive, to treat others with kindness, to show respect, to reach out with mercy and forgiveness. Christians all over the world, you know, the, the world has been changed in such a good way because of Christians. Think of all the hospitals with the name Saint something. Why is it called that? Because a Christian organization founded it. Think of all the schools that have been founded by Christians trying to educate, trying to help. Christianity has been a good thing and continues to be a good thing. But some false teachers make the whole thing maligned by society. But there are people, good people, in churches all over America, all over the world, people who are growing in faith, becoming sanctified, walking like Jesus. But society sees the exception and claims it as the rule. That's why false teachers are so dangerous. Verse 3 says, And in their greed, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Their condemnation pronounced against them long ago has not been idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Peter is clear that we all need to be wary. He is warning these Christians they may be exploited, they may be deceived. I want to warn you, you may be deceived. Lord willing, I hope it's not by me. I'm trying to do everything I can to preach this word of God and not this word of God. Because this word of God is just, eh. This word of God is hallelujah. See, the best way I know to make sure that you're not deceived is to tell you, when you hear anything come out of this mouth, check it with this word. You need to check it yourself. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you. See if what I said makes sense. See, we have the benefit that the first listeners of this letter did not have. Because we have God's holy word. We have the scriptures. We have the gospels that declare about Jesus. We have the Old Testament. The early Christians, all they had was the preachers that came. All they had was people that showed up and, and would proclaim that they had an experience and proclaim that they had been with the disciples or proclaim that they had seen Jesus or had been with them. But we have the testimony. We have the truth. But the danger is not just for the original hearers. Because it was centuries, even though the Bible was written in the first century after Jesus, the New Testament, it was centuries before the Bible became available to the masses. Not until Gutenberg with his press started printing out Bibles daily did people even have an option to, to have one. And even then, most people couldn't read. It was a nice ornament if they could afford it. And still today there are places and people that do not have a Bible in their own language to know what the Word of God is. I think the bigger, well, I don't know if it's a bigger tragedy because that's certainly a huge tragedy. And there are people working all the time, Bible translators, to, to sometimes they have to develop the languages for the culture. They don't even have written languages. Just how when the Gutenberg Bible came out, Martin Luther began to translate into German, he had to develop what German was. They didn't have a written language. And so some cultures are still developing the written language so they can put the Bible in it. Yet, what is another tragedy is so many of us have these at home. You might know where they are. You might even have opened it from time to time that so many of us don't read it. We don't know what it says. We need to know what it says because it's the truth. This will help you guard against heresies. This will help you guard against false teachers. See, God holds teachers to higher standards because teachers are responsible for making sure the truth is propagated. They have been for centuries because while people may have a Bible at home and they may try to read it, sometimes it's difficult to understand. So we know that people who have, who have had some training and learning, of course, I believe the Holy Spirit will, will help you with it anyway, but uh, uh, you get teachers who can try to rightly divide the word of truth, as it says. 
And if you're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth and you divide it wrongly, well, there's going to be some serious repercussions. See, God is serious about punishing those who deceive, those who exploit, those who deny the truth. Listen to how Peter explains this, starting in verse 4 of 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. Peter's begin, beginning with a litany of God's punishments. We often try to avoid thinking about that. We know that through Jesus' death on the cross, we don't have to endure the punishments if we believe and put our faith and trust in him. Amen? If you don't know that, I want to make sure you get that. You got to make sure you rightly divide the word of truth, of course. Don't teach anybody falsely. But if you believe and trust in Jesus, these punishments, these are for those that don't. And we don't like to talk about it because we don't like to think about punishment. We try to avoid that. But yet this is the truth. Not as I said it again, as God said it. We know that once we believe in Jesus, we have the promise of eternal life. But we, we need to be remembering that God is serious about this life. God is serious about what we do. This is important to him. He didn't leave heaven and come to the earth and go to the cross because it was trivial. He didn't die because it was, eh, just something to do. He died because he wants us, and he loves us, and he wants to get us and help us to get it right. So we need to take it seriously and not take it lightly. We know that even though we don't like to talk about punishment, we cannot change it just because it doesn't suit us. We cannot cut it out because we don't like it. Joseph talked about that last week too. Cutting things out that we disagree with. But we won't talk about that because uh, it just doesn't suit our modern sensibilities. It's not about our modern sensibilities. It's about what God says. We need to stop trying to fit God into our society. Instead, try to form our society by what God says. See, we have to line up with him, not he doesn't have to line up with us. Peter reminds us that even the heavenly beings, the angels, were not spared when they sinned. You see, God is serious about this stuff. In fact, he says something we often forget or maybe didn't even know, that hell was not created for people. Hell was created for the angels, the demons. They're the ones that he created hell and sent them into. And it continues in verse 5. And if he did not spare the ancient world, even though he saved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly, he reminds us of the judgment of the flood. He said, angels, they got cast into hell. The ancient world... You know what happened to them? It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. There was judgment on the flood. God had said, why did I create these people? They, they're so mean. They're, they're hateful. They hurt each other. They don't care about anybody. But he found one family, Noah, and his family that was righteous. And he said, instead of destroying everything, I'll start over with this one family of righteousness. And then after, as they got off the boat, there was a rainbow, which was really a reminder of judgment. Some people take the rainbow to think of something else. Well, the rainbow is really a reminder that, remember what God did? When the world was so against God, he destroyed it. Remember that. When it rains, and you see a rainbow, He's like, I'm not going to do it again, but I don't want you to forget what happened. Sometimes we look at the rainbow and think, oh, that just means everything's good. No, that's not what it means. It means God will punish. He's sparing us, hoping we get it right. He said he's not going to flood the world again, hallelujah. But there is still judgment yet to come. We read some of that earlier from Matthew 24. When God put the rainbow in the sky, it was to remind the world that sin is judged and the cost is great. 
course, God did save those who believed. That's the theme we see throughout the scripture. God saves those who believe. But for the ungodly, those who are callous toward God, those who denied or rejected or rebelled against God's message, they sealed their own fate. Those who were mocking Noah, who didn't believe him, who didn't want to hear that God had anything to say. Peter continues in reporting his judgment in verse 6. He says, And if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned, he condemned them to extinction and made them an example of what is coming to the ungodly. I wish we had time to talk about some of these in more detail. But you know, there were ungodly, unspeakable acts in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham pleaded for the city. And basically he said, if, if there's 50 righteous there, I won't destroy it. And, God's like, and Abraham's like, how about, how about 40? Can we, you know, maybe 40? God's like, okay, if there's 40. Well, maybe, what if we get to maybe 30? Finally got down to 10. If there's 10 righteous people, can you spare the city? God's like, sure. If there's 10 righteous people, I'll spare the city. Couldn't even find 10. Remember, this was after the flood. This was after rainbows appeared in the sky. After they remembered or should have remembered, there's judgment for sin. Still, this, this culture of people who descended from Noah, who knew about God's judgment, who knew that God would be merciful to those who believed, who God was merciful to Noah, the sign of the sky reminded them of the judgment, yet they were still wicked and ungodly in unspeakable ways. <coughs> city was condemned to ashes. Verse 7 through 9 says, And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the lawless. There that word is again. For that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Here we see, if we're looking, if we're looking we hear some good news here. He's talking about punishment. He's talking about judgment. But even in the course of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, God showed mercy on the righteous. Because God always wants to show mercy on the righteous. He wants to show mercy on those who believe. On those who trust him. On those who hear the message. This has always been God's way. But it doesn't mean God's not going to punish sin, because that's also always God's way. Righteousness demands that sin is punished, and God is righteous. Peter says that the Lot story shows that God can allow the righteous to live with the unrighteous for a time. But eventually, the righteous will be called out. That's sort of a precursor to the rapture idea if you think about that. It's kind of a great pre preconfiguration of it, letting us see this in action in the Old Testament. Because Lot was there in Sodom among this wickedness, and messengers from God, angels showed up, and he had a choice to receive them, to welcome the messengers from God, to hear what they had to say, or reject them. To those who received the messages from God, the messages from God, Lot, in this case, they were rescued from destruction by listening and obeying the messenger. I'll tell you, we have a messenger. We have someone sent from God. His name is Jesus the Christ. And he bought you with a price because he wants to rescue you from the unrighteous world around you. And he will let you stay in here for a time, just as he says here. But there will be a time when the punishment will come, and you will be rescued from it. Hallelujah. Such a powerful example. 
verse 10 describes the wickedness of those days. See if this sounds at all familiar. Especially those who indulge their flesh in depraved lust and who despise authority. Bold and willful, they are not afraid to slander the glorious ones. This is what Peter is saying about what the times were for Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, those who indulge their flesh in depraved lust. This, this sounds like it's ripped from the headlines, right? People in societies around the world seem to glory in their depraved indulgences, doing unspeakable things and bragging about it. And yet, not just that, and despising authority. I don't need to tell you, despising authority is gaining traction. I mean, I don't know if you watch the news, I kind of hope you don't, but if you do, it's all over the place. Sometimes I think this whole thing might be over sooner than we think. Because people continue to be bold and willful, as it says here, slandering God, slandering Jesus, slandering Christians, slandering everyone. Cancel culture, canceling everything, anything that's good. To think that Peter wrote this nearly 2,000 years ago, it seems like he's describing modern day society, not just in America, but around the world. And yet, as Peter wrote this nearly 2,000 years ago, he was describing a culture that was nearly 2,000 years before him. So as much as I'd like to think this might be over soon, and even so, come Lord Jesus. People have been this way for a long time. For a while, God lets it go, and then punishment and mercy. These teachers are so arrogant and bold. They deny the truth of the message. Sometimes this arrogance and boldness allows them to rush in where angels fear to tread. Verse 11 says, Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not bring against them a slanderous judgment from the Lord. <laughs> I'm just thinking, even angels, a far greater power than humans, uh, they wouldn't be there so bold as to do some of the things that humans are doing. Bold, maybe not the right word. Arrogant, perhaps. Stupid, perhaps. Verse 12 describes them like this. These people, however are like irrational animals, mere creatures of instinct, born to be caught and killed. They slander what they do not understand. And when those creatures are destroyed, they also will be destroyed. Peter certainly recognizes the danger of following heresies, of believing false teachers. He calls these people irrational, creatures of instinct, slandering what they do not understand. Isn't that the truth? As I said, sometimes it confounds the rational, which means we don't understand it. But it doesn't mean it can deny the factual. But because they can't understand it, they slander it. You have to accept the facts, accept the truth, and try to understand it. Instead, they slander it, and they will be destroyed. Why does Peter have so much to say about this? I mean, he goes on quite a bit, doesn't he? Because this is important. Our lives, our eternal lives, in some sense, hang in the balance of who we believe, of who we listen to, of what truths we're going to apply to our lives and what we're going to reject. Reject the heresies. Accept the truth. Because people are looking for the truth. But if they do not hear the truth, they may believe whatever else is said. Whatever else fills the void. People want to know. They need somebody to tell them. Woe to those who lead people astray. We've seen that clearly. But for us, we need to be sure that we are not following those that tickle the ears. Those that say the things that sound good say the things that we like to hear. Instead, we need to be sure we're hearing the Word of God, whether we like it or not. You ever have your parents say, I don't care if you like it, it's good for you. Something like broccoli, you know. 
It's good for you, even if you don't like it. Sometimes the Word of God may not be what we like, but it's what we need. And sometimes that includes the judgment of God, because God is just. God will forgive those who seek forgiveness, those who receive his message, those who hear and believe and follow and obey. But here is the point so many people wish to deny. Those who do not seek it, those who reject God, they have, they have chosen their fate. I want you to understand, God does not reject people. People reject God. God wants all to come. Scripture is full of stories. God wants everyone to come to repentance, to accept him, to love him as he loves them. But people choose their own way. This is why, as we are still in the season of Easter, and remember, every Sunday is actually a celebration of Easter, but as we are still in the season of Easter, we must share the good news of Easter. We must tell the world that forgiveness is possible. We must tell the world that Jesus truly does love them. We must tell the world that Jesus died to forgive them of their sins and resurrected so that they can have eternal life, that death is not the end, that they can live for more than just this mortal existence because this is shallow in comparison to what the depth and riches of what God has for us. The world needs to know this because they think if this is all there is, but it's not. There's so much more. Someone must tell the truth. I hope I do, but I can't tell everyone. Maybe you can tell some. Because lives are in the balance. Eternal lives are in the balance. Today, I hope you make sure you have secured your place. I hope you make sure you know Jesus, that you've trusted him. But once you get that assurance, it's kind of like in the airplanes. Once you have your mask on and you're safe, help others next to you. Let everyone live. Give them the truth. Give them the hope. Give them the life. Believe the witnesses. Reject the heresies. Accept salvation through Jesus Christ and live. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power that is in what you have shared, what you have done. You love us so much. Help us to love you. We pray this morning, if there's anyone who hasn't put their faith and trust in you, that they would receive the message and they would reject the falseness, but hear the truth, that they would come to believe your death your burial and your resurrection was on their behalf that they could have their sins forgiven and restored to a new life of hope and promise and joy. Lord, fill this place, fill all those listening with the Holy Spirit. Let them sense you and know you. And those that have already known you, let them be able to go out with that spirit to share this message with others. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.